All right, choir, come on up. We're going to start here in just a couple minutes. We really need you. We need a full choir. We're going to sing the song in the beginning, in the beginning. Welcome. Good to see everybody here this morning. Glad that you made it out. I want to take a few moments and welcome our first-time visitors. Thank you so much for being with us. Hopefully you got a bulletin when you came in. Inside that bulletin is a Connect card. It's right on the inside fold. Just want to encourage you to take just a few minutes, fill that Connect card out, and place it in the offering plate when it comes around in just a little bit. And on the way out, if you would, stop by our Welcome Center. We have a special gift, gift for you this morning if you're a first-time visitor. Just want to let you know how thankful we are for your visit. I want to let you, just want to encourage you this morning to be in prayer. Uh, we've been having issues with our live, our live stream this morning. Many of you know Brother uh, Russ Miller's here, uh, creation scientist, and it was so good this morning, but we had issues with the live stream, and I believe it only went out over YouTube this morning. Is that right, Brother uh, Soner? So right now, is it on now? It's not on Facebook now still, okay? So be in prayer about that, that God would just work and move, and we'd be able to get that out. We will put it back on again later. Of course, it's being recorded in the service this morning, but it's not going out live over Facebook. So just pray that God would bring all that together, if you would. A couple quick announcements this morning. Just want to remind the ladies, this ladies' luncheon is right around the corner. So next weekend is uh, Mother's Day weekend. Somebody say amen. So I hope you're thankful for your mom. We just want to encourage you to, to invite folks out to be a part of that. It'll be a very special service next weekend. And then the weekend after that, on that Saturday, is our mother-daughter luncheon. And it just gives an opportunity for people that maybe were going to be out of town celebrating, doing different things to be here uh, all together on that weekend on the 18th. So ladies, make sure you get signed up for that. That's a very special event. I'm going to have, if I could at this time, uh, I think that Liz and... Um, Christine are somewhere. There they are, making their way up. I wanted to make a special announcement for you this morning. Okay. Um, we would like to make a special announcement for um, our Millions Missing event. It is next Saturday. Um, Millions Missing is a global campaign for myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as ME or CFS. Um, my mom has been dealing with this illness for three years. 
And during this time, she's been housebound and mostly bedbound. Um, the longest period of time she's been bedbound over just seven months straight. Um, this illness makes it nearly impossible to do simple tasks, and she's missed out on a lot of um, family get-togethers and walks with her grandkids. And um, some of the symptoms include extreme fatigue, inflammation, forgetfulness, and sleep disruption. So if you know my mom or someone dealing with any a chronic illness or like any autoimmune dis diseases, um, please come and join us in supporting the millions missing from our daily lives. And um, this event, like, so our goal is to increase government funding for research, clinical trials, medical education, and pl public awareness. And so it's this Saturday, the 11th, um, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. at the Capitol in Salt Lake City. Um, if you come, wear red and bring a pair of shoes to represent the millions missing due to ME. Um, I know it would really mean a lot to have you there for my mom, especially with um, to show that you support and love her. And so, yeah, we hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Hope and pray the church family will be there. Amen. Information about that's right in your bulletin, and we'll probably send some reminders out as well. It'd be great if we can come together and be a part of that event. It's coming weekend. Hey, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight, 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. Russ Miller again. Uh, after the services, we'll have ice cream. It's going to be a great time down in the lower building. Um, and you know, it's, it's going to be uh, it's, it's going to be awesome. Take advantage of the opportunity to invite people out. Then Monday night, we'll also have hot dogs at 6 o'clock, some refreshments, and then 7 o'clock, we'll kick everything off. I've got folks that, the, the good friends of mine, that are going to be here uh, on Monday night to, to hear the presentation. Take advantage of the opportunity to get folks out to be a part of this. Let's get around, have some fellowship, shake some hands, and welcome folks here this morning. like to ask you to make your way back to your seats. It's such a good, good day in God's house. If you were unable to be here during the Sunday School Bible Study Hour, it was amazing. And what we're going to do is ask you to go to our YouTube page, Faith Baptist Layton, and you'll see our symbol, you know, our logo and stuff, and that's us. And then if you'll subscribe, and then if you'll hit the bell, then you'll get all the videos, like right here in church, when we started live here, you would have gotten a notice that we just went Facebook, or not Facebook, YouTube live. We all, we've been going Facebook live, and it's been working out just fine. About a month ago, we had a big problem with YouTube not going out. This morning, we had a big problem with Facebook not going out, but YouTube did. So um, Facebook doesn't like it when you put YouTube videos on Facebook, but that's what we're going to do um, because it's their fault. So if you're listening out there, it's your fault. If you don't like it, fix your stuff. Okay. Hopefully they will. I'm sure they will, because I'm sure they don't like, you know, people using other venues. But it's a very special day here. The subject is so important. Either the Bible is God's word, and everything in it is exactly as it says, or it's not. But if it's not, then what is God's word in God's word? Is anything true in God's word? What if everything was true in God's word? And it is, which is how you can have a savior and how you can ha know for sure that you're born again and, and know that you can have fellowship with God now and go to be with him forever one day. These are all important things. And you may say, well, I don't see how that's connected to, to uh, creation. It is. It is. If, if God didn't know what he was talking about on creation, then how do we know he did on anything else? And there is no science 
against creation and what the Bible says. And that's what he'll be talking about today. It's fantastic stuff. I'd love to be able to tell you to take your Facebook. You can tell people you're at church right now. That might help. You could even go on there and say, go to our YouTube channel and watch this live. But you won't be able to, to tell them to, you won't be able to share your live feed with uh, Facebook right now. But we're going to dedicate this day to the Lord. Brother Doug Hughes is going to open us in a word of prayer at this time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given to us, Lord. And um, Lord, as we ponder our hearts and our thoughts, God, I pray that you'd settle us, Lord. I pray that you would uh, give Brother Russ the words to speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray for the many members here, God, and the ones that could not make it. Think of Amy Brown, Lord, of the loss of her mom, God, and uh, Lord, young lady that's... Uh, Lord, having some difficulties, Lord, uh, Miss Nelson, Lord, I, I pray, God, that you give the doctors wisdom and help find out the reasons why she's having the issues that she's having, God. I pray for my wife's daughter, Margaret Perry, God, that she's at the U of U, Lord, have she just passed having a surgery, Lord, in recovery. I pray, Father, most of all, that she get saved and see you through all this, Lord. And Father God, I do pray that if there's anyone here that knows you not, I pray that they would see the need and they would want to accept you today as their personal Savior, Lord. We give you all the honor and glory this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you're in the choir, head on up. We're going to sing right after this song. All I want held dear, built my life. second real quick let's sing that last verse again you know it's interesting if you were here in Sunday school um, brother Miller was talking about how um, there's no death before Adam and eventually you know death came into the world death suffering all of that stuff but listen to this verse um, know the power of your risen life and to know you in your sufferings to become like you in your death my Lord so with you to live and never die it's interesting how Adam, through his sin, brought death into the world, 
but eventually Christ brought life through his death and eventually um, we'll live with him and never have to experience that death anymore. Um, just such a great truth and principle. Um, again, let's sing that one more time. Oh, to know you the power of your risen life and to know can be seated.
Jesus Christ the Lord. All right, let's stand and sing Spirit of the Living God. <clears throat> Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. before you just with a grateful heart we thank you lord that you've given so much to us this great country that we live in uh, lord the riches that you've given us we pray the lord that we give back the portion that you've already given to us we ask that you bless lord the giver and that the uh, the, the funds that come in that lord god god will go out and further the gospel not over here in Layton, but throughout the valley and across this world we just thank you lord in jesus name amen, amen. All right, you could be seated, but sing this song with us. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. sing the first verse again and then the fourth verse. <clears throat> Actually, I think they're the same. So we'll just sing it twice and we'll sing the chorus a cappella. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have Decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow? 
past thirsty for something to satisfy so many wrong roads with no one to blame but hope like a stranger looked in my eyes and called me by name that's when I knew understand it how someone so perfect could love even me but the mystery of grace is what can't be explained he took all the pieces covered the scars and everything changed that's when i knew who jesus was that's when i realized the depth of his love he could have condemned me but chose to forgive That's when I knew, oh, that's when I knew who Jesus was. That's when I realized the depth of his love. He could have condemned me, but chose to forgive. when I knew the moment his grace broke through that's when I knew whiter than snow yes whiter than snow he washed me so Are you washed in the blood this morning? Do you know Christ is your Savior? Such a blessing and privilege to have Russ and Joanna Miller with us. Uh, met them several years ago, and we've had them, I think this is the third time. We try to have them about every two years, and maybe we should have them more often. It's so fundamentally important. Because if people can grasp the fact, and they seem to off and on, you watch a documentary, I watch most all the nature documentaries, and there's always this word that comes up, design. Hold it. You got to have a designer if you have a design. The, you know, the interest, intricacy and the complexity of all that is around us is God telling us about his existence. But today we're being told to deny his existence by 
through evolution and these sorts of things rather than trust that there really is a God and accept the obvious, really, that there really is a God. Anyway, I won't take up any more of his time. It's so good to have you here. We're really looking forward to what you have to say now and tonight and Monday night. Come on. How about that? Yep. Okay. How are you doing this morning? Good. Awesome. Hey, again, my name is Russ Miller, and uh, my wife, Joanne, and I, we have a ministry that we run. Uh, we feel God gave us to steward. We call it Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries because sometimes we talk about creation and biblical accounts like we'll do this morning, and sometimes we talk about uh, evolutionary accounts and secular accounts and atheistic accounts because secularists own the system. They own the public schools, the universities, the media, the entertainment industry, the national parks and museums, and they teach their interpretation of evidence as if it were science, when it's really just their interpretation of the evidence based on their starting religious beliefs, their worldview. You know, um, the Bible tells us, and this isn't doing anything, so I'm gonna let Dennis get that going, but we don't want to put any pressure on him, even though everybody's waiting to see if he can fix this. So, <laughs> thank you, sir. Yes, it's working. Good job. I told you I was 75% sure you'd do it, and I'm 99%. Okay. The Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. I mean, think about that. All Scripture. That should be make, making a believer out of a person very easy. It should be easy to be a believer today. You just read God's Word and you believe God's Word. How, how e much easier can it be than that? But it's not that easy, is it? You see, Satan is really good at what he does. If you underestimate the father of lies, the father of deception, you're likely to get deceived yourself. He is an expert at what he does. But all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. He throws out so many stumbling blocks and questions. He always brings in questions to try to undermine people's faith. First time he shows up in Scripture, Genesis 3, verse 1, he, the first question in, in the Bible, hath God said? He starts planting seeds of doubt by asking questions. So tonight, in tonight's message, I'm going to answer the top 25 skeptical questions out there. And these are so common that now they're common questions from well-meaning people, too, because Satan is planting those seeds of doubt. Like, how do you know the Bible's truly the Word of God? How do you know that God's Word is true? Isn't a day and a year the same, or a thousand years the same thing to God? I'm going to answer the top 25 skeptical questions tonight. And tomorrow night, in my personal favorite teaching, I will destroy the fairy tale of Darwinian evolutionism, which is taught as if it's science in our schools and undermines the faith of millions of Christian kids every year. Right. Millions. It's a, it's a teaching I gave at one college that one biology teacher saw, quit her job, became a Christian, and now teaches science in a Christian school. And the school, as a result, launched an accredited course attacking me and biblical creation. They ran for at least four years. And all because of the teaching I'll show tomorrow night. If you have any issues with Darwinian evolutionism or you want to know how the Bible actually fits real science and how real science is a believer's best friend, I think that'll help you a great deal. But this morning, let's, let's talk about something different. Uh, you know, Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. Do you think it was important to Jesus what Moses had to say? We celebrated his resurrection a couple of weeks ago. On the day of Jesus' resurrection, he approached the two disciples walking away from Jerusalem, leaving Jerusalem. They had heard he had resurrected. They didn't even believe it. They were leaving. And, and Jesus approached them. And on the day of his resurrection, what was the first thing he began teaching his disciples from Moses on the day of his resurrection? And Jesus tells us, Moses wrote of me. Well, through the inspiration of God, Moses is used to lay down the foundation of the gospel message in the first and the third chapters of the book of Genesis. If you're going to build a structure, the first thing you do, you have to build a solid foundation to build upon. And that's what God does in Genesis 1. He lays down the foundation of the gospel message. This is why you see creation under relentless assault from the enemy. Have I mentioned that Satan is really good at what he does? This is where we're told that God gave us a perfect creation. It was perfect. 
There was no death. There was no suffering in it. It was perfect. Well, it's not perfect today, is it? You know, how many of you heard or even thought yourself at one time or another or had someone ask you, how can there be a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? Have you ever heard something along those lines? It's one of Satan's first questions to get people to doubt God's word. Well, if you leave here with nothing else today, know how to biblically answer that question. It's unbelievably simple. And it's right there in Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. And the answer is this. God didn't give us the world the way it is full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. Well, what in the world happened to it? Adam's original sin. You see, Adam's original sin allowed death to enter, and that's why we live in a world full of death today, but have a loving God that cares about us. There's a biblical answer. Pretty simple, isn't it? But you see, once you, if you've accepted old earth beliefs and put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam sin brought in death. See that? Wait, did I mention Satan's really good at what he does? So most Christians can't answer that question, but now you can. And it's a very simple question. But more importantly, Adam walked in the garden with God, but we don't walk in the garden with God today. Why not? Well, see, that original sin separated us from God, requiring a redeeming Savior Amen. die on a cross so our sin could be forgiven and we could be redeemed with Him for eternity in heaven. I call that the cost. And ta C-O-S-T, creation, original sin, separation, and the cross, the cost. And talk about a loving God. He loves us so much that despite our sin that has separated from him and corrupted his creation, he sends his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross so we can spend eternity with him in heaven. Well, it doesn't get much more loving than that, does it? But you see, if you've accepted an old earth belief that puts death before Adam, you can't answer any of that, can you? It's the age of the earth matters. And people don't understand it because they don't understand the death issue. Satan is really good at what he does. And my friends, that's the foundation of the gospel message. Now, through the inspiration of God, Mo Moses also told us that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Oh, come on now. That would be a global flood. I mean... Now, and I asked Pastor if I could just be honest with you guys today, and he said, be totally honest. Is that okay with you guys? Yes. You're sure? Yes. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. If there had really been a global flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, I mean, if God's word were really true, the evidence would be overwhelming. There should be nothing to even argue about. I mean, let's speculate. Let's say there really had been this worldwide flood. I would think the crust of the earth that we live on and walk on would be made up of sedimentary layers of rock that have been stratified out. The sediment stratified by grain size, weight, and density. You know, like a miner with a pan, he scoops up some sediments of water and sloshes it back and forth. The moving water stratifies out sediments by grain size, weight, and density. So on a global scale, I would expect the crust of the earth to be made up of all stratified layers, like all shale and all sandstone and all mudstone, stratified out, separated by grain size, weight, and density. And I think those layers laid down by water would be full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried before they could rot away or be eaten by scavengers. I mean, if, if God's word were really true, so what do we find today? Well, the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of stratified layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density full of billions of dead things that we call fossils. Exactly what would be there if the Word of God were true. And my friends, the Word of God is true, word for word and cover to cover. You know, Jesus said, if you do not believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? How indeed. See, the secular or the humanistic religious worldview, which is taught as if it were science in our schools that they own, uh, is based on the thing about this, the exact same sedimentary layers of rock stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. You know, people ask me all the time, Russ, what evidence do you have the Bible's true? I always say, well, the exact same evidence atheists use to say it's not true. Don't we live in the same world? So don't we have the same world, the same evidence? Yeah, it's never been about who has the evidence. It's about who gets to interpret the evidence. Take those sedimentary layers of rock stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by moving water. They own the system, and they teach their whole system, their whole belief system is based on those layers. They just say, no, no, those layers laid down by water didn't form in a flood. No, no, they formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time as you slowly evolved all on your own. 
Same evidence, different interpretation. It's never been about the evidence. It's about who gets to interpret that evidence. You see, once you put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam sin brought in death, separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Did you know that more than 90% of Christian seminaries now teach an old earth belief that puts death before Adam? It's a big problem. 98% of churches won't let me share this. 98%. Well, we lose 90% of our kids by the age of 20 because of the teaching of evolution. It's a big issue, my friends. But, you know, Jesus said this would be what it would be like right before his return. And seeing God's word is true. Word for word and cover to cover. So if you have friends in, in churches that are not getting this information, share it with them. It's got to be a grassroots level effort, my friends. Atheists understand this very well. This is from the editor of American Atheist. If there was never an original sin, there's no need of salvation. You see, no original sin, no separation. No separation, no need for redemption. Atheists understand this very, very well. And if the age of the earth is an issue for you, don't think, don't think, gee, there's something wrong with you. Over half of Christians struggle with these issues. And that's the reason we have our ministry. We're helping Christians see the truth. We're, we're helping people learn and grow so they can share this with others. So why did God destroy his awesome creation? Well, back to Moses. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and he said, I will destroy man. And in 2 Peter in the New Testament, we're told, And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So there are eight people on board the ark. Uh, there are four couples, Noah, his three sons, and their wives. Four couples on board the ark. National Geographic did a study of the human gene pool, certainly not a friend of biblical creation, but they came to the conclusion that all humans come from one of four distinct Gene pools. Well, I could have told them that just by reading Genesis 1, right? Read the book of Genesis. It answers so many questions. You know, if you started with four couples about 4,500 years ago, and if they averaged having 2.2 children per couple, you would have about 7 billion people on earth today. Census studies say there are about 7 billion people on earth today. Imagine that. Okay, a fair question. Had there been a global flood, shouldn't there be some flood legends floating about? Did you know that more than 300 ancient flood legends are known? That almost every ancient civilization starts with a count of a few people surviving a flood and repopulating the world? In other words, ancient history supports the word of God. Okay, well, how did Noah and his family collect those animals from all over the globe? There's a lot more than eight of us here today, and I think if God gave us somewhere around 120 or so years to collect all the animals from all over the world, and we have cars and trucks and boats and airplanes, I don't think we could do it. Well, how in the world did Noah and his family do it? Well, they didn't collect any animals. God had the animals come to them, two of every sort, seven of the clean types. Okay, well, how did Noah and his family fit those millions of animals on board the ark? Well, let's get a feel for how many creatures may have been on board that ark. First of all, the Bible indicates he only had to bring land dwellers that breathe through their nostrils and some birds. That gets rid of a lot of supposed issues. Fish wouldn't have been on the ark, right? Water-dwelling mammals like whales and porpoises wouldn't have been on the ark. Amphibians didn't have to go on the ark, etc. So that gets rid of a lot of supposed issues. But more importantly than anything is this phrase. He only had to bring two of every kind not two of every variety of a kind. You see, 10 times in the book of Genesis, we're told that plants and or animals will bring forth after their kind. In other words, people will bring forth people. Pine trees will bring forth pine trees. Dogs will bring forth dogs. It's called microadaptation or variation. It's the only thing real science ever observes. It's not Darwinian evolution says one kind will bring forth a different kind. Did you know there's never been a single example of Darwinian evolution found? Uh, we'll talk about that though tomorrow night. But Noah didn't have to take all 350 pairs of dogs on the ark. He only had to bring one pair that had the full canine gene pool, and they brought forth dogs after their kind through the sorting or the loss of the starting genetic information. It's called gene depletion. It's what breeders use. 
plant or animal breeders. If you want to get purebred yellow labs, you breed puppies with the traits together you want, and you're losing, not gaining, you're losing the information you don't want until you end up with a purebred who's lost all the other information. So if you breed two purebred yellow labs, guess what your puppies are going to be? Yellow labs, that's the only information they have left. You breed two mutts together, guess what your puppies are going to be? You don't have any idea. You have to wait until they're born to figure that one out. So Noah only had to bring two dogs on the ark uh, that had the full canine gene pool. And I'll cover this tomorrow night in our Science versus Darwinism in the textbooks. Um, have any of you ever been told you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? Have you guys ever heard that one? They throw that out all the time, don't they? Now, real science, a believer's best friend, I've seen studies in Nature magazine where there's a 30% difference. So why are they still saying it's 2%? In fact, a similar biochemistry proves your evolutionary past. They should tell you guys that you evolved from worms. Your biochemistry is 75% the same as that from some worms. Yeah, your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana. Anyone evolved from a banana? Just three people, that's not bad. Because the last time I was on a college campus, 500 students raised their hand to that question, and they were serious because they're being taught we've all evolved from common ancestors, which would mean you are related to bananas. I got home that night, I got online, checked my family tree. Hey, there wasn't a banana in the whole bunch. I didn't find it very appealing to begin with, so that was all right. But, We'll cover fraud after fraud, all these things. Notice how their proofs of Darwinism are always drawings. There's an old saying that goes like this, Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. You take away their box of crayons, they've got nothing. <laughs> but they own the system and man, they draw the evidence that they think would be there if they could just find some of it. But you see, gene depletion makes Darwinism impossible. I'll explain that. Uh, tomorrow evening. Let's get back to that ark. How many animals might have been on that ark with Noah and his family? Well, we have about 2 million classified species today. Only about 40,000 of those are vertebrates. If you take out the marine creatures, the amphibians, and the water-dwelling animals and mammals that wouldn't have been on the ark, you're left with about 3,000 kinds. Two of each kind, 6,000. Throw in seven of the clean types, you're looking at around 7,000 animals on board the ark with Noah and his family. And the average size of a land dweller that breathes through his nostrils is the size of a house cat. So the real question becomes, how did Noah and his family fit somewhere around 7,000 house cat sized critters on the ark with he and his family? Well, I'm just going to speculate here because I wasn't there. but. I think of the, of the handful of, of large critters like elephants and giraffes or even, even the handful of small of large dinosaurs. God brought young ones. They live longer to reproduce. That was their purpose. Some of you guys are looking at me like, am I saying dinosaurs were on the ark with Noah and his family just a few thousand years ago? Well, the Bible says he is to bring two of every sort on board with them. The Bible says man and beast were both made on the sixth day. Now, like I said earlier, the Bible's true or the Bible's not true. So let's look at this with an open mind, and you can make up your own decision what you want to believe. Now, there were only about 50 kinds of dinosaurs. You know what the average size of a dinosaur was? About the size of a sheep. Some were smaller than chickens. Of the handful of large ones, he only had to bring two of each. The seropods were the largest, the long necks and long tails. I'm going to guesstimate he brought young ones that were probably about the size of an Indian elephant. And those are probably the largest animals on board the ark. So getting them on board was not a problem. Yet what is the very first sentence you read in a secular dinosaur book to your children and grandchildren right before they go to sleep at night? 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. You've just taught them that death and suffering existed long before man. Now let me ask you a question. Who saw dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago? Yeah, exactly. That's a belief. That's not a scientific fact. So later on, you try to tell that same child by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. And they're going, wait a minute, mom, wait a minute, grandma. You've been reading me these dinosaur books that say death and suffering existed for hundreds of millions of years before Adam came along. Do you see the stumbling block? 
Wow. Did I mention that Satan is really good at what he does? He teach death existed before Adam, and you can't teach Adam sin brought in death. See that? You can't teach them both. That's the reason these seminaries now are teaching there was no Adam. Have you been hearing those teachings? That he was just an allegory, a myth? Well, yeah, I, I spoke up in uh, Grand Rapids a couple years ago. Calvin College is there. They teach theistic evolution about this Jesus who used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly evolve us. I used to be a theistic evolutionist, by the way. I'm here to help those folks, not attack them. But they sent 50 of their science honor students there to harass me and attack me in a loving Christian way, I think. But I did the message I'm doing tomorrow night, Science and Darwinism. It just destroys Darwinism. I walked off the stage, three of their students ran up the steps behind the, the curtains, got right in my face. This one young woman said, I hold an advanced degree in biology and came here to debate you about Darwinism, and you just showed me everything Calvin College is teaching is based on a lie. I said, well, praise God. Go back and tell them the Bible's true. <laughs> and start humbling themselves to God's word. Well, they didn't do that. I think they, they picked up on the death before Adam issue that day. And now Calvin College is teaching that there was no Adam. He was a mythical creature. Why would you do that? Well, well, picture it. Think about this. They're teaching billions of years of death brought man into the world. That's the Secular Atheist Foundation. The biblical message is Adam's sin brought in death. You can't teach death existed before Adam and teach Adam's sin brought in death. Do you see that? So they're just getting rid of Adam. The answer is to humble yourself to God's word. Right? right? Isn't agreeing with me on that? Just humble yourself to God's word. Let me show you why we can believe God's word if these are an issue uh, to you. For instance, how do dinosaurs fit into a biblical worldview? That's a picture of my wife, Joanna, by the way. She's the uh, pretty one with the white blouse on. Right, <laughs> right in the lower corner. Really, you, you can meet her today. She's here. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to go through some information here. Just have an open mind. And when I'm done, you decide for yourself what you want to believe about dinosaurs. First of all, the word dinosaur was only invented about 178 years ago. Prior to that, they were called dragons and serpents. If you look in a dictionary today under dragon, you'll be told mythical creature. Here's a dictionary not even 80 years old. Dragon, now rare. A huge serpent. A fabulous animal. Look in old dictionaries. There's nothing mythical about them. You know that ancient history books are full of thousands of counts of man and various dragons. We call those dragon stories today. Let me give you a couple examples that come out of what is now India. You guys heard of Alexander the Great? When he conquered that area 2,300 years ago, he wrote that the, his soldiers were scared by the great dragons that lived there 2,300 years ago. 1,900 years ago, Apollonius of Tyana wrote, the whole of India is girt with enormous dragons, killers of elephants. It takes a big critter to kill and eat an elephant. We don't have an animal that can kill a healthy adult elephant today. Something different in, the, in India 1,900 years ago. And hey, think about this logically. We find cave drawings and man-made carvings of all sorts of dinosaurs all over the world. Picture this on a timeline. Here we are today. We're told these things were made 700 to 2,000 years ago, okay? People all over the world know what they look like 700 to 2,000 years ago. We didn't recognize dinosaur bones until 190 years ago. If we didn't recognize dinosaur bones until 190 years ago, how come people all over the world knew what they looked like 700 to 2,000 years ago? I mean, somebody had to see him, right? They found this uh, cave drawing of a, of a duck-billed dinosaur, Parasaurolophus specifically, in New Mexico a few years ago. The duck-bills all had these odd crests on their heads. And nobody knows what those crests were for. There's a lot of different theories. But this guy was found as a Parasaurolophus. See the big white crest come off the top of his head? And the, uh, the sacralists that found it, who believed dinosaurs had gone 65 million years, were scoffing at this because whoever drew it, and they said it was made about 1,200 years ago, drew it striped like a zebra. So they were scoffing at it, going, they couldn't know it was striped like a zebra. They'd been gone 65 million years before a man came along. And then about 15 years ago, they found a mummified duck-billed dinosaur in South Dakota. It was mummified. The skin was preserved. And it was striped like a zebra. Somebody had to see him. Did you know in the last 15 years, more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have been found? Did you guys know that? That still have 
soft, flexible dinosaur tissues, red blood cells, amino acids, and last year they found dinosaur DNA in some of those remains. Those biological materials couldn't be more than a few thousand years old at the most. See all those sedimentary layers laid down by water in which their remains are found? They, they were laid down by <clears throat> water. God's word is true. Word for word and cover to cover. And this shows that the secular interpretation of dinosaurs is wrong. 100% wrong. They were shocked by all these biological materials. So you know what they're saying today? We didn't know biological materials could last 65 million years. Man, blinded, absolutely blinded. I feel sorry for some of these folks. But, you know, what about the Bible? You know, uh, in Job, I think God's describing a dinosaur here, but see what you think. People say, well, the word dinosaur is not in the Bible. Well, the word dinosaur was only invented 178 years ago. So, you know, Let's see, serpents and dragons are mentioned almost 30 times. I think God's describing a dinosaur here in Job 40. He says, Behold now behemoth, which means largest, which I made with thee. We were both made on day six. He eats grass like an ox. Well, some well-meaning theologians who have bought into the secular atheist view that dinosaurs were, lived hundreds of millions of years ago, they, they try to explain this. Well, maybe behemoth is an elephant or a hippo. Well, let's look at the information. Let's read further. His strengths are in his loins and belly. Strong loins and strong bellies. Elephants and hippos, they do have big, strong bellies. Maybe one of those is behemoth. This guy's got a big, strong belly. You know, maybe, maybe he's behemoth. But here's a creature that had to have strengths in the loins and belly to balance that huge, heavy, long neck and head and that long, heavy tail. In fact, the Bible says he moves his tail like a cedar. A tail like a cedar? That's, maybe that's a cedar stump, right? But my friends, there's a tail that's like a cedar tree. Let me ask you a question. Because I think God deserves the credit for his creation and his created beings. And I think we need to recapture dinosaurs from Satan, who's using them to mislead not millions, billions of people around the globe and are not accepting God's word. And we need to recapture them for God's glory. How many of you can believe, like the word of God says, the overwhelming archaeological, geological, biological, and historical information attest that man and dinosaurs lived together in the past? How many of you can believe that? Absolutely. You'd have to ignore all the scientific evidence. Remember, if dinosaurs had been gone for 60 plus million years before man, there would be no evidence of man and dinosaur living together. Zero. Certainly none of recent activity. Goodness gracious. Speaking of millions of years ago, my clicker just stopped working. There we go. Oop. Then it just decides to catch up all of a sudden, you know? Hey, how many of you believe in fire-breathing dragons who lived with man recently? Oh, that's about 5%. That's actually a lot. That's actually quite a few. Um, you might be thinking, who cares? Well, here, here's the issue. If you send your kids off to college and they don't have a viable answer uh, for this, uh, they'll probably be one of the 90% to have their faith undermined by secular atheists. I've met many college professors who, hold, who have told me face to face their entire purpose in life is misleading Christian kids. Um, I was speaking on a college campus a few years ago and during the q and I always have to do a Q&A. I don't just give my hour-long message. I have to give an hour-long Q&A because I have to let the kids see the professors have nothing. Because if I just speak and leave, boy, after I leave, oh, if I could have spoke, boy, so I have to let them see, no, no, they, let them have their best shot here. They, they've got nothing. They own the system, though. And um, so during the Q&A, one kid stands up, and instead of asking a question, he just says something putrid about Christians. And the whole auditorium roars in laughter. And God just gave this to me. I, I just stood there until the laughter died down. I said, now I have a question for all of you. If this young man would have said something like that about a, a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a New Ager, he would have been kicked out of this college. But he said something like that about a Christian, and you guys just celebrated it and thought it was so funny. Why is that? Total silence. And I'm talking with God in my head, and I'm saying, but they're going to kill me. But... <laughs> But I said, okay, I'll say it. I said, well, let me answer that question for you. You see, Satan already has all non-believers. 
He doesn't want you attacking and wasting your time on non-believers, but Christianity is the real deal. And that's why on this secular campus, you can't say a bad thing about anyone except Christians, and you can say any putrid thing you want and celebrate it because Satan is a god of this world, and Jesus Christ is the real deal. And you could have heard a pin drop. I thought, I'm dead, but he's like, God, God puts that hedge of protection around you. Anyways, I'm still here bothering people today. But, you know, the Bible says, Leviathan, none is so fierce. If a good scoffer is going to go up to a Christian kid, you don't believe in fire-breathing animals, do you? Oh, that'd be ridiculous. Well, let me go to Job 40, where you're, 41, where your God talks to the Leviathan, a flame goes out of his mouth. Well, do we, we don't have fire-breathing creatures to test, study, and observe today. Can we come up with a theory to explain them? Well, what about this as a theory? This is the bombardier beetle. When he's threatened, he sprays an attacker with a chemical that is the boiling temperature of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. He was designed with twin chambers that store these two volatile chemicals apart from one another because if, if he was evolving slowly, the first time those chemicals touched, kaboom, that had been the end of the bombardier beetle, by the way. That's another issue. But when he's threatened, they go from the storage chambers to a combustion tube where an enzyme is added, causing oxidation to take place, producing a chemical, the boiling temperature of water, and he can hit an attacker right between the eyes with boiling chemicals. It takes him less than one second to produce his boiling chemical. How long does it take you to produce boiling water? Yeah, several minutes, right? Talk about biblical design, by the way. What's that got to do with fire-breathing creatures? Well, let's go back to those duck-billed dinosaurs like the Parasaurolophus that was found striped like the zebra. The duck-bills all had these odd crests on their heads. Nobody knows what it was for, but it was a, had, a, had a complex series of passages, tubes, and chambers. Some of the more common uh, guesses, or maybe it was a trumpet it used in the mating season, or maybe it was a, was a uh, sword it fought other dragons with, or, or maybe it was a big nose, an olfactory organ. No one really has a clue, but what about this as a theory? Uh, perhaps these were storage and combustion chambers that stored volatile chemicals apart from one another. And perhaps when he was threatened, the chemicals went from the storage chambers to combustion tubes where enzymes were added, and when we breathed this concoction out and it hit oxygen, well, perhaps we had a fire-breathing leviathan. And it's just a theory. It's not there to test, study, and observe today. Oh, but the Bible also talks about fiery flying serpents. Fiery flying serpents. Here's a, here's a painting about 570 years old of St. Michael and the angels fighting the wyvern, which was a large reptilian creature with long leathery wings. Oh, this is the Tronodon. He was a large reptilian creature with long leathery wings. Notice a huge crest coming off the top of his head. Nobody knows what the crest was for. It was filled with a complex series of passages, tubes, and chambers. Maybe those are storage and combustion tubes. And perhaps when he breathed this concoction out and they hit the oxygen, well, perhaps a flame went out of his mouth and we had a fiery flying serpent. Hmm. It's just a theory. We can't test, study, and observe that today. I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. Just north of Flagstaff is a Wapaki National Monument of Native American ruins. And on the Wapaki is found this cave drawing of a fire-breathing creature. We're told it was made about 1,100 years ago. Notice the huge crest coming off the top of its head. Hmm. And let me ask you a question. How many of you think that it was terrifying to live with dinosaurs in the original creation? Anyone think that was maybe kind of scary? Maybe they just considered us to be fast food? Well, the answer is no. You see, dinosaurs didn't eat people in the original creation. You might think, how would you know that? Well, the word of God. To every beast, I have given every green herb for meat. Plants were made to be the food source. Plants don't have a living soul, nefesh kaya. So plants were made to be the food source. There was no death and suffering in the original creation. Now, once Adam's sin corrupted the creation, it probably changed fairly quickly. But in the original creation, there was no death. It wasn't until Adam and his family got off the ark that we were told every moving thing shall be meat for you. So it's okay to kill and meat eat meat today if you receive it with thanks to your biblical creator. And we're told that Jesus will give us a new heaven and a new earth in the nearing future where there be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, where the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the lion will return to eating straw 
like the ox. So I tell people, if you like eating chicken or halibut steak or you like deer hunting with your dad, you need to get it in now because it's not going to be that way in the new heaven and the new earth. Talked about prehistoric animals earlier. So they're uh, not prehistoric. They're pre-flood animals. Um, I talked about the giant uh, grasshoppers and cockroaches found today. These are pre-flood animals, not pre, uh, uh, pre-historical. So what caused animals to go extinct? Well, you know, there's about 2,000 theories. The most popular one over the last 35 years that most people were told was a meteorite hit the planet, caused a blackout, the plants died, the animals died. There's really not much scientific credulity to that. It's lost most of its scientific standing. It's what most people believe today because it's what they were taught. I have a theory that fits all the evidence. I think God judged man's sin with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, eroding the top two miles of sediments during the first 150 days of the flood. And then as the fountains of the deep ebbed, they started laying down those same sediments in the second 150-day period, now stratified and separated by grain size, weight, and density in the shale, the sandstone, the mudstone layers that we have today, full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried during that flood so quickly They didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Wow. Yet tonight, millions of kids around the world, the last thing they're going to hear before their precious little minds fall asleep is 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. They've just been taught death and suffering existed before man came along. Satan's seed is being planted. And Jesus said, the enemy that sowed the lies is the devil and the harvest will be the end of the world. Think about Noah and his faith. By faith, Noah being warned of things of God not seen as yet. He lived in a world where it probably hadn't even rained. And God tells him to drop his career, his hobbies, everything he's doing, and spend about 120 or so years building this ark because there's going to be a global flood in a world where it hadn't even rained. But Noah moved with fear, with respect to the word of God, and prepared an ark to the saving of his house, and became the heir of righteousness, which is by what? Faith. We're supposed to have what? Faith. Faith in the word of God. Think about Noah's faith. He's he's working on this ark for 80 years. 80 years, longer than most everyone's lifetime. And it's never even rained on the planet. And people are scoffing at him and cursing him and his family. And he stays true to the word of God. And after about 120 or so years, the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And they went in as God had commanded. And when they went in, God shut the door. And the global flood burst forth as the fountains of the deep erupted. And the flood was upon the earth. You know, until that moment, everybody on the planet was invited to walk up that one narrow plank way through that one and only door into God's one and only plan of salvation from that coming global judgment. And only eight people put their faith in the non-compromised word of God. There were probably people saying, oh, once that flood bursts forth, then we'll get on the ark. That wasn't what God said. That was not God's plan. That was their plan. How did that work out for them? See, it's not our plan, it's God's plan. See, today, everybody's invited to walk up that one narrow pathway that leads to that one and only door into God's one and only plan of salvation from his coming global judgment. And that one plan is Jesus Christ. And not a made-up Jesus you won't find in the Bible. The Jesus found in the Bible is the one and only way. Who said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by him. He does not say, if you do not accept me, make up a different me. Does that make any sense? If I'm challenging you, I'm doing it because I want you on that narrow pathway. Not on the broad way that leads to destruction thinking that it's our way, when it's not our way, it's God's way. Jesus said that before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying right up until the day Noah entered into that ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And Jesus warns, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. People be eating and drinking and, and going to beer parties and tailgate parties and football games and talking about someone bounced the ball all week long and ignoring the word of God. And Jesus will return in the twinkling of an eye. And then it's too late. 
See, the time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior was years ago. If you hadn't done it then, it was last week. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to get right with Jesus immediately. Amen. Because once he returns, it's going to be too late. Get right with Jesus. The calling of our ministry is to teach about the creation, evolution, age of issues, expose false anti-biblical teachings to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. And that includes challenging the secular atheist beliefs that have inundated the church today. I'm not here to attack you if you've fallen for some of those. I used to be a theistic evolutionist. I'm here to get you to realize you're, you're getting deceived and going to challenge you to be like a Berean of old and compare what you think to what God's Word actually does say. Tonight we'll answer the top 25 skeptical questions. Tomorrow night we will have a great time destroying the fairy tale of Darwinian evolutionism. Uh, you can check out my uh, videos and all, and my wife has them in the back. Uh, I don't copyright my DVDs. I tell people, make all the copies of my stuff you want. Give them to everybody you know. Ask them to make copies. Let's get some information out there. Let's make a, an eternal difference in people's lives. Uh, my book, The Cost, covers the top 10 Old Earth beliefs, the top 10 Darwinian beliefs, the top 10 fruit of these two beliefs, and the top 10 proofs of biblical creation and the flood uh, references more than 200 Bible verses written the same way I speak. Easy to understand. I want people to understand what I'm saying. I want you to get that information and share it with others. I have two coloring books with lots of information in there. The, the coloring part is really for kids. Uh, the information is for kids and adults when they read them. Although adults can color them too, but I would suggest do it when no one's watching you. Um, <laughs> one's on Noah's Ark and dinosaurs, and, and I explain the flood and uh, death poor Adam issues, and our America's Christian heritage, which is being largely erased today. We uh, lead Grand Canyon Rim and Raft trips. I'll talk about some of that later tonight, perhaps, um, and the Grand Staircase. But let me end with this from the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and all things were made by Him. The Word of God is our Creator. Do you see that? The Creator is the Word of God. And the Word, our Creator, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Our Creator, the Word of God, is who? Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of Christians don't realize Jesus is the Creator. He's first the Creator. That gives Him the right to come and live on earth and be our Savior. And Jesus, who is the Word of God, of God, and, and he also called himself the bread of life. So he's the creator, he's the word, and he's the bread. But when tempted by Satan, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. Amen. And my friends, that means word for word and cover to cover, including the first five words of the Bible, which read, in the beginning, God created. Amen. You can believe those first five words and every word thereafter. Word for word and cover to cover, put your faith in the word of God. Let me in my part with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the, all the dear folks that are here today and the leadership of this church that stand on your non-compromised word. I hope and I pray the information we share will be a blessing to many and challenge us just to humble ourselves to your word over our ideas. I ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. thank you. Amen. Let's stand this morning. If you're here this morning without the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is no better day than today. There's only two classifications of all that is. I want you to think about this. Creator, created. That's it. The creator, and the created. You're one of the two. Can't be both. Can't be both. Even God's not both. Hear me can't be both. You're either the creator with no creator. His I amness, his Jehovahness. He's the creator, though he himself uncreated. And then there's all that he created. The reason people don't want to believe what the Bible says about creation is it forces them to be accountable to God. But sin did enter the world. That's something else that there's tons of evidence for, right? There's sin all around us. We all need to, we, we, none of us can fix our own sin. Only God has the power to forgive sin. So where do we need to go to get our sin forgiven? To the Creator, to Jesus. 
God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's what his name means. God, Elohim, it's his plural name. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus, God the Son, came and died for our sin. Paid the full price. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He's alive and well today and he wants to have a relationship with you. And then he wants to take you to heaven forever and ever to be with him when you leave this earth. If you're here this morning without Christ as your Savior, would you come? You know, I, I can only imagine all the things. I hope there are teenagers here and college students here and young parents here that are, that are concerned about their children, that are concerned about the other kids they go to school with, that are concerned about the situations that they've faced and will face. And this is a very important day. It may not be the easiest day to give an invitation for us. So what I'm asking you to do is ask God, what is he doing in your heart this morning? And respond to that. Respond to what God is doing in your own heart this morning. We'll just let him play through a verse. If nobody uh, comes, that's okay. We want God to do it. We want God to move. I don't want to push you. But if God's moving in your heart to be saved, come. Let somebody take the Bible and show you how you can be. If there's another spiritual decision that God's working in your heart about making, it may have nothing to do with creation. It may have nothing to do with the topic today. God does that sort of thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. If you preach the Bible, God moves. That's how it works. Now, you don't have to preach on a particular subject to have God move in another one. I've seen it so many times. Parents, I hope we're praying for our kids. What's it like being a second or third grader that they're watching the same thing you did down there, okay? So now these second and third graders say, God created everything. I knew he did. And they go to school and the teacher said, no, he didn't. Sometimes teachers have said, and I've had, the, I've had to deal with this, no, he didn't, and you can't talk about that at school. That was in Oregon, not here. Yes, he did, and they can talk about it at school. So, but imagine being second grader and having that happen. Our kids are, they need to be equipped and they need to be supported. And that's what our church is trying to do. And I know that's what you're doing as parents. I know you are. This is why it's so important. Today's so important. Tonight's so important. Share this. It just breaks my heart. Every time I talk to him, I can't wait to get him here. And my brain ahead of time, I'm going 90 miles an hour. I'm thinking up different things I want to talk to him about. And we sit and we talk and we talk. We could literally talk for hours and hours and hours. And then I find out he's having trouble getting into churches. This is disgusting. Every church, every Bible-believing church in America ought to want to have Russ Miller come and speak at their church. I don't understand this. I mean, I don't, I guess I'm having trouble coming to grips with the reality that this is where we are. How's that going to change? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How can you help? Go home and share. If you have to go to YouTube and get this and put it on your Facebook, do it. we got to start sharing the Word of God. Use, your, use the tools God gave you. Go talk to your neighbor. See if we can't get them here tonight. There's some folks that we've invited that I think are coming tonight. Okay, so, so important. Pastor Hall. That was awesome this morning, amen. Looking forward to tonight, looking forward to Monday night. Like Pastor said, take full advantage of the opportunity to start today uh, inviting people out to be a part of our services, amen. Well, it's good to see everyone. want to encourage you to be back as well uh, for the ice cream social tonight after services. Hey, Pastor, what are you wearing? How are you coming dressed tonight? <laughs> I don't know. You want to, are we going to, is it going to be a casual Sunday night again? <laughs> We're going to do a casual Sunday night. Okay, come casual. It's just going to be a good time of fellowship, family time together, and then, of course, spending time together afterwards, playing basketball, everything else. So come dress casual tonight. It's going to be a great time here in the Lord's house. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being together today, Lord. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for his truth, and thank you for the fact that we can count on it. And Lord, I just want to pray, just a, just a flood of people came into my heart and mind, Lord. Folks, you know that I've invited for tomorrow night, Lord, people that I wish would be here tonight. And we just want to place it in your hands. God, help us to have the courage to step out and to do what you would have us to do, Lord. Then we leave the rest in your hands, and, and Lord, to those, those folks that we'll invite. And Lord, I think about those that we know that don't know you as Savior, God. Maybe those that have been mixed up and 
And uh, Lord, I know many believers that have went to, to colleges and just been turned upside down when it comes to this type, type of information. God, I pray you draw them here tonight uh, to hear what your word really has to say about these things. We'll thank you and praise you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.